Hello everyone and welcome back to Relu's Mobile Sandbox in Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1. In this video I present the most awesome Earth orbit satellite ever. Now you might think I'm stretching things, but wait till you see it. You might also think I'm forgetting about the moon, but no, I don't mean artificial satellite. The moon actually sort of sucks. It's rather boring. It's just gray. It's a lump. It's big. It is big, but it's not very functional. It doesn't do anything. Well, it stops asteroids, some of them, but you know. Uh, it has a history of millennia and everything, but think of all the trouble we have to go through with it. I mean, it doesn't send photos back. It doesn't send its own samples back or anything like that. It's It just doesn't do that sort of thing. This does. This does do that sort of thing. It does have sample return capsules. Well, photo film return capsules. It is, of course, a reconnaissance satellite, and it is Keyhole 9 launched on a Titan 34 rocket. Uh, this type of satellite was ma manufactured in the 1970s and early 1980s. And we will get it going right now. So it is on a automated launch script on the Titan 34, launching out of Vandenberg into a polar orbit, a 96 degree orbit, and roughly sun synchronous. All the keyhole satellites launched into a polarish orbit out of Vandenberg. Keyholes 1 through 8 were rather simple. They were all built on top of an Agena upper stage, so they were small. And they had either one or two film return capsules, a set of cameras, and a service module. This too has film return capsules, cameras, and a service module, but it has five film return capsules because it's much larger. For the Keyhole 9 satellites, there were 20 of them, and the last one exploded in 1986 due to a launcher failure. There were 19 of them otherwise. The early ones, the first 17 were launched on Titan 3, not a Titan 34D, so this would be one of the last two that actually made orbit. And it would be contemporaneous with the space shuttle, and there's a reason I mentioned that. You might think, well, there must be Keyhole 10, I mean, we've uh, this launched in the 80s, we've had some time. We've had more spy satellites, obviously. Well, Keyhole 10 was the Gemini spacecraft with the manned orbital laboratory. That didn't happen. That was just a plan. It didn't actually happen. But the manned orbital laboratory system would have actual people up there uh, taking the photos. And that would have been awesome if it actually happened. But it, it's more of a spacecraft in that case than what I would normally term a satellite, which I think of as automated. Uh, Kilo 11, you know, there was a Kilo 11 too. Uh, Kilo 11 you would recognize, perhaps, because it was the basis for the Hubble Space Telescope. Bas basically, the Hubble Space Telescope was a repurposed spy satellite. And that was awesome in its way, of course, it has great optics and everything, uh, the spy satellite version. But it's different from this in that by that time, they didn't need to bring the film back. They could just transmit it. So it's a much simpler satellite from that perspective. Here, this is the ultimate satellite where they had to bring the film back physically. So the film reels were fed into return capsules that dropped off and re-entered and had to be caught by a plane, a C-130. All the early ones, Keyhole 1 through 8, had to do that too. But uh, they only had one or two. This has five such return capsules. Uh, some variants of the Keyhole uh, 9 system had four. This uh, satellite was also called Hexagon. It's called Big Bird because it's just huge. It is 16 meters long. It is 3 meters in diameter. And we have core ignition as the boosters are about to separate. The core on the Titan rocket does not ignite until the boosters are ready to separate. And so they'll be going off. There they go. Very nice. So this is obviously not being launched on an Agena type rocket, there's a Titan. So the Titan has a much higher payload capacity to orbit which allows this to be so much bigger than the earlier Keyhole rockets 1 through 8. Uh, sorry, Keyhole satellites 1 through 8. The total mass of this is um, a little bit over 11 tons. Each of the return capsules, well, there's four main ones and then one smaller one. Each of the four main ones is 0.8 tons, and a human could fit inside them. The Mercury capsule was only 1.1 tons. Here we go. Fairing set. 
This model was made by Raider Nick. The rocket was made by Raider Nick. None of this is my models, okay? Uh, I have to make that clear because I've done some modeling. This is all Raider Nick's thing. Raider Nick does a lot of Soviet rockets and spacecraft and also the Titan rocket uh, and stuff associated with it like Cassini and stuff like that. Some Earth orbit satellites he's done. Uh, so, but this is... Basically what happened was Raider Nick asked me about the Agena, some, some question about the Agena. And so I started looking at uh, the Agena spy satellites perhaps thinking of convincing him to do one of the early keyholes, which were the only ones that I was familiar with. I keep seeing these keyhole 1 through 8, and so I thought they were all the same. Then I hit keyhole 9 and go, oh my god, look at this. And so I showed him a photo of a keyhole 9, and again, you have to understand the scale of this. A person can fit inside there. This is 3 meters in diameter. So, you know... It's nearly uh, two people tall. It's not quite two people tall, but, you know, it is it is big. In the photos, it gives a much better impression of how huge this is. And and I convinced him to do it somehow. I think he, he saw the awesomeness of it, really. So each of these is a return capsule for the film. These are the cameras. There's a service module in the back. And there's a, this is actually another return capsule. I don't know why. Uh, Raider Nick suggests that maybe it's for balance. Anyway, you'll see, we'll try and bring one of these back so you can see how the whole system works. But it is complicated. Even the International Space Station doesn't have five return capsules. <laughs> it has, uh, you know, it has a lot of things that uh, end up in fiery demise in, or, uh, in Earth's atmosphere, but it doesn't have five thing at any given time it never has five things that survive re-entry so there you go there's the ISS covered for you no I mean I know I'm I mean uh, ISS is a tough one because it, it's more of a spacecraft as far as I'm concerned not a satellite satellite but you know you could call it a satellite um, I, I sort of think of it as a different class but here we go second say ignition and off it goes. The Agena upper stage will be about half the diameter of this. So this is now our upper stage. It's the second stage of Titan. And so having such a small stage like Agena limited the size of the spy satellites. And so they decided to stop using that with this system. The problem is, of course, this is ridiculously expensive. <laughs> I mean, all these drop pods having to catch the little pods once they finish descent. It, it ultimately, in terms of our dollars right now, it probably be it translates to about 750 million, but it'd probably be more expensive than that, uh, because these days contractors really do milk the defense department. <laughs> so um, yeah, it'd probably be more than a billion easy, and so that's why they came up with the idea of launching the shuttle from Vandenberg to service this sort of thing, right? I mean, it's this sort of spy satellite that they thought, well, if we could just, like, put some more film in, you know, open the back up, put some more film in, add some re more return pods, you know, if we could service it somehow and build it to be serviced, then we wouldn't have to send a new one up all the time. The space shuttle would have to top it off with fuel, which is hydrazine. It'd have to put the film in, and if you can open the top and put the film in, that'd be great, and attach new pods to the bottom. But even, you know, bad estimates for how much a shuttle launch would cost still would yield that being worthwhile because it'd still be cheaper than launching a totally new one. They had to replace these every few months. Uh, it had about a five, six month lifespan before it re-entered. And that was partly because it was kept in a lower, a uh, really low Earth orbit. It was around uh, 180 to 260 kilometers. It varied, of course. At that level, there's so, uh, lots of drag, and so it eventually be pulled down, and it uses its fuel to push itself back up. So that's why it runs out of fuel every few months. But if you could bring new fuel up to it, it needs about 2.4 tons. Uh, then you could extend its lifespan. And then if you could add more film canisters and all that business, it'll be a complicated thing. It's not a single orbit 
a servicing mission like they thought about doing. Uh, that is not what we're talking about here. This would be a very complicated servicing mission, but in theory, maybe it could be something that would be done and save money. Of course, ultimately, uh, if they wanted to, they would service something like Keyhole 11, which is, again, like Hubble, and we know they could service something like Hubble because they did that, so... But this servicing this one would have been rather more interesting, uh, I think. So I have an idea. It won't be in this video, but I want to try and launch a uh, space shuttle to it to at least add more return capsules and top it off with fuel, but that's gonna be an endeavor. <laughs> that's gonna, well, maybe it'll be done by endeavor, I don't know. But anyway, here we are making orbit. That is done. And let us change camera. And we are going to separate off the spacecraft. Okay, RCS. Is it RCS active? So this is the control section and service module. It's RCS is active. SAS on. It's got really fancy solar panels, perplexing solar panels, really, because of how they're stowed and how they extend. So let's have that animation. Um, yeah, we. I, I looked at them and I had no idea how the heck they were supposed to extend, and this is, this is good. <laughs> this is good. I think, uh, yeah. It's, it's, they're interesting. They're interesting solar panels. It's a one kilonewton engine. It's like an ant engine. And then little 70 newton RCS thrusters for orientation. It, it did have this weird pattern on the back. Don't, don't ask me why. This is a very complicated model. I expect that this will be part of Raider Nick's US probes pack. But it is a really big model too, so I don't know what he's going to do about that. I vaguely thought about doing sort of a... Um, an ominous Star Destroyer pass, like at the beginning of Star Wars. But... Seriously, the limitations of KSP graphics doesn't really allow for- I mean, maybe if I tune the shader in a particular way to make it a little bit more ominous, but the, the body of this is just so bright. <laughs> I mean, it's yellow. So, yeah. Which, I guess, is another reason why they called it Big Bird, because it's yellow. The little drop pods have an SRB to deorbit, and they have nitrogen RCS thrusters. And there's not a whole lot of nitrogen. So we have to be careful. It really, they really are like little mercury capsules with the SRBs for deorbit and everything. But there is a difference. They don't re-enter with the flat side down. They re-enter with the knob knobby side down. Okay, there's the sun. Oh, this, that, that's actually a good shot, huh? Okay, I've got to turn RCS off. Separate off one of the pods. Off it goes. Very nice. So, switching to the pod. We really should have uh, made sure we charged up. But, so there's the SRB and also, uh, th no, that's just the SRB. There's also an RCS pack somehow. It's complicated. And then the parachute. Uh, that, that, no. That's the parachute. And that's the return capsule with some ablator and everything. Oh, wait, there. That's the RCS part. Okay, so I'm gonna very, very, very carefully. Have we activated the RCS? Yes. Turn. And uh, we want to point retrograde, so that'll be north at this point. And I'm gonna just do time warp and let persistent rotation do it. We'll probably end up too far south. 
trying to use as little nitrogen as possible. It ends up very, very low on the periapsis. So this little guy, I think it's a 4 kilonewton engine. I'm gonna fire it now. 212 meters per second, it says. 2.5 kilonewtons. I'm just gonna sort of manually steer this. SAS would probably use too much nitrogen. And if we take a look at our orbital parameters, Going from a 241 kilometer orbit. I know I'm a little bit off of retrograde, but I don't want to force it right now. It's possible to mitigate how steep the periapsis is by doing sort of a radial or normal thing. However, I think they wanted it to come in sharply. That helps guarantee where it's going to set down. Okay, so that is good. Now, we don't want to separate until we reorient it because the RCS goes along with it. So I'm going to do an RCS burst this way. And let it take its time. As long as it gets there by 140 kilometers, which is the atmosphere. But after we let go of the retro pack, we're not going to have any control. So we might as well arm the parachute now. Well, one thing that's positive about this way of going in is you'll definitely protect the parachute. And we'll wait until we're really close to the atmosphere before separating that thing off. And during time warp, I can see the residual rotation. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Okay, separation. Okay, switch. Alright, hopefully it'll be steady enough. We're entering the atmosphere now. Uh no, it's got a little bit of residual turn towards that side. Oh gosh. I think the decoupling's just a little bit off. We'll see how this works. Don't go parachute side first, please. aerodynamic. Honestly, I don't know why they wouldn't just keep the retro pack on since it's gonna be, well, block the way of the parachute. Mercifully, I'm not worrying about signal this time, but yeah, we're way south now. We're, we're not, I took too long with all the turns, so just started out a little bit earlier. I'm not sure how they actually fed the film into these things. I'm sure there was a trap door that got shut or something. Once the film was done, once, once that reel was done. So there is basically a series of reels going into the pods. So we'll take a look at the G-forces, which will be more than would be good for humans. Okay, that seems to be a peak right there. And it's coming down. Let's see. 10.1 G's only. Not bad. Not bad at all. When you think about it. When you think it's not going blunt in first. It's going nose first. Alright, now it's all about the parachute. Again, sense of scale is tough with this. So I think what I'm gonna do is bring it outside and put a Kerbal next to it and do Kerbal for scale. Now I think it had a fairly large parachute, so it actually be slowed to fairly slow descent rate so that the plane could catch it. However, Raider Nick made it so that the parachute did not slow it that slow because we weren't we can't catch it with a par uh, with a plane because there's no collider on the parachute. I think and so the parachute isn't going to slow it. Uh, it's just for show and it'll smash into the surface rather quickly so as not to belabor the issue but if you have a technique to uh,
catch it while it's on parachute, you might want to replace that parachute. Okay, it actually survived splashdown though, which is interesting. I guess recover vessel. Actually, just in the SPH is fine. You can see little Kerbals walking around compared to the size of this. They're about one meter tall, so it gives you a rough idea of how big this particular bird is. As far as maybe I'll knock it down to uh, most awesome Earth orbit artificial satellite or something. I don't know. Uh, give me your thoughts. I mean, it's it's pretty remarkable. And there's never going to be anything like it again because we can just transmit the photos now. So, they've taken all the fun out of it. No, I mean, yep. It was a specific thing for a specific time. Very specific purpose. And we just don't have need for it like this again. I don't know. Maybe you could think of something. But I would sure like to do that shell servicing mission, but I'm going to need a lot more practice launching out of Vandenberg and coming back. So that you can look forward to. But for now, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.